everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Um, just if you would just stand and join us for worship.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy, happy 4th of July, happy Independence Day. Uh, I'm sure you have some plans to celebrate today. But before we celebrate the birth of our nation, we will celebrate the Lord's Day. Because I believe, and I hope you also believe, that the Kingdom of God is more important than the United States of America. So, today we celebrate the Lord's Day, and uh, today we also get the privilege of sharing the Lord's Table. It's been so long, it's been far too long since we've been able to do this in person together. And so today's kind of a special day. And I'm really looking forward to that, um, uh, sharing the Lord's Table with you all again. So, um, yeah, happy Independence Day, but happy Lord's Day. So today we will begin our, um, the second half of our sermon series on our great high priest. Our great high priest. Over the last couple of weeks we've been talking about uh, looking at the book of Hebrews. And we've been looking at how Jesus serves at our, as our great high priest, this intercessor, this mediator between God and man. Between God and us, for us. And today we're going to take a look, we're going to begin taking a look at John chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 17. 
And the entire chapter is usually, typically called the High Priestly Prayer. John chapter 17, if you have little uh, chapter headings in your Bible, you might see it labeled as the High Priestly Prayer. Now, Jesus himself didn't call this prayer his High Priestly Prayer. This is something that the church, we have called it that over the centuries and the millennia. But it's called this the High Priestly Prayer because in John chapter 17, Jesus makes intercession for us. He prays for us, which is exactly what a priest does. And so in this chapter, in this prayer, we really see him fulfilling this role of being our great high priest. And so if your Bible just doesn't ha happen to have the little chapter heading of high priestly prayer, maybe you could make a note of that in your, in your Bible or something like that. So let's, let's take a look at our passage. Let's read this together. John chapter 17. Let's read this together, and then we can dig into what it means and what it matters for us that Jesus prays this prayer. Okay. All right, let's read this together. John chapter 17, verse 1. Let's read it aloud. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you, the eternal word. We listen intently to your words. And we know that you intercede for us, you pray for us, you care for us, you present our needs, our struggles for us. So God, we just uh, want to learn what it means that you are interceding for us, that Jesus serves as our great high priest. So Lord, give us your spirit of wisdom, illumine these words for us. Thank you, Lord, for the great privilege of celebrating the Lord's Day together. And to be able to celebrate the Lord's table together, Lord, is, is wonderful. It's such a privilege and a blessing. So thank you, God. Prepare us. Prepare our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this is the beginning, the first five verses of the high priestly prayer. I want to give you just a little bit of background in case you haven't read uh, the book of John or John chapter 17 in a little while. So Jesus prays this prayer uh, right after he says some things to his disciples. This is all coming after the Last Supper. Okay, the Last Supper. I know it's been a couple months since Easter. We try to think back on, on the, you know, the Easter story. He's saying this after the Last Supper to his disciples. And what we know comes after the Last Supper is the last hour. And Jesus knows that uh, Peter will deny him, that his disciples will Abandon him. And so he knows that he is about to go to his death. Remember the Easter story. 
This is after all these things. He knows all this is about to happen. This is coming. Nevertheless, he wants to encourage his disciples. He wants to give his disciples one last encouragement. Even though he knows that they're going to run away and they're going to flee and abandon him. And so, what does Jesus do that he knows is going to be able to encourage them, give them courage and strength? What does he do? He prays for them. Our Lord Jesus prays for his disciples. Go back one. All right. So let's take a look at this passage. Well, we'll take a look at it in three parts. John chapter 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. So he begins this, this high priestly prayer. And if you take a look at this verse right here, maybe the first thing that, that strikes your, your eye is that Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. That's not something that we typically do when we pray. We don't go like this. You might wonder, is this significant, that he lifts his eyes to heaven to pray to his heavenly Father? Should we do that too? Maybe we should start doing that. Is it, does this get God's attention in some special way? Now, for us, we typically we bow our heads, hold our hands, close our eyes, right? As a... As a Kind of to prepare us for submission, humility, coming before the king, that kind of a posture. Should we do this instead? As Jesus did. Is that going to get God's attention? Well, the way that Jesus prays like this, it's not some special thing that only he gets to do. This is, this is actually a very typical prayer posture for a Jew in that time. Um, it was pretty normal. This is the way that praying was taught. This is the way that praying was modeled for Jews in the synagogues and the temple. It was just the normal way that they prayed. And let me give you an example of this. Uh, you might remember the parable of the, the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. In the, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we see this contrast, right? The, 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 the Pharisee, he prays like this, right? But then what do we see the tax collector do? Uh, next point, please. All right. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So, the fact that he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven indicates that he, that, that was the normal way of praying, of lifting up your eyes to heaven. That was the normal way of praying. But he would not even do that because he felt so unworthy. So, back to Jesus then. When Jesus lifts up his eyes in heaven to pray to his heavenly Father, again, this isn't some special, exclusive uh, posture that only he gets to do. This is just the normal prayer posture for a God-fearing Jew. Now, it's possible that the fact that he does this does tell us that he's outdoors. Right? Because after the Last Supper, they were indoors in the upper room. But the fact that he's able to lift up his eyes to heaven tells us maybe he's outdoors. Maybe he's on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, so again, remember your Easter uh, stories if you're tracking where he's at in that story. He's possibly on his way to Gethsemane now. Okay? But that's really all that this this posture of lifting up his eyes really indicates to us. So, my point 
the physical posture of his prayer isn't as important as the spiritual content of his prayer. This is just a normal thing for him to have done. So what we really need to focus on, what makes this the, the high priestly prayer, is not what he was wearing and the robes and the, you know, all the garments and, and this exalted way that he was praying. That's not what's important. What's really important is what he is praying. Okay. And so let's take a look at it. Uh, next slide. Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. And so, Jesus knows that his earthly ministry uh, was not just coming to an end, but was coming to a climax. The hour has come. This is his shining moment. This is it. The hour has come. Now, if you read the Gospel of John, uh, you become very aware that Jesus seems to have been very aware that he had this divine schedule to keep. That, that the time was of the essence. That there were certain things that he was expected to do at certain points of his earthly ministry. You, uh, you get this sense that he has a very particular schedule if you read the entire Gospel of John. Now, let me just give you an example. Next point. John, chapter 2, verse 4. This is the very beginning of his public ministry. This is the wedding at Cana. You might know of the, the miracle of turning water to wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He's like, what do you want me to do? It's not my time yet to really reveal myself in all my glory. Okay. So very, from the very beginning, he had this sense that there was some kind of a, a schedule he had to keep. Okay. Uh, another one. This is to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming but neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. There is a time that's coming. The hour is coming. Something's going to change at a certain point in the very near future. Okay, another one. John chapter 8, verse 20. This is, uh, he's preaching against the religious leaders uh, who were seeking to arrest him. John chapter 8, verse 20 says, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Okay, so we know that when the hour comes, he's going to get arrested. He, he, something's going to happen. Some, something's going to change in the way that we worship God. Right? Jesus is going to reveal himself in glory, in some way, when the hour comes. Right? You guys tracking with me? So throughout the Gospel of John, it's like you're on edge. You're like, what's going to happen when this hour comes? All these things that Jesus has been hinting at. What's, what's about to happen? And so he knows that there's this very specific schedule that he has to keep. There's this very specific path, this purpose for why he's put here on earth. And his time was of the essence. He knew this hour was coming. And so, when we see in John chapter 17, when he finally says, finally, he says, the hour has come. We're supposed to realize that this is the culmination, the climax of his entire earthly ministry. What's about to happen is really, this is it. I mean, this is it. We've been waiting for this, the entire Gospel of John. This is the very reason why Jesus was sent 
by his Father. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Whatever is about to happen next, Jesus says, God would you be glorified in this. Glorify me so that I may glorify you. This is his one desire, his, his dying wish, his lifelong mission has been that God would be glorified in and through him. Whatever I've done on, on my time on earth, may it have been to the glory of God. And whatever I must face now, may it be to the glory of God. So we see here that the Father's fame, God's reputation, and exaltation and glory, that's been Jesus' whole life motivation. And it now gives meaning and purpose to his death. God, be glorified in me. That's essentially what Jesus is saying when he says, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Everything I've done, I hope that you get the credit, Lord. I hope you get the fame. I hope people glorify you and come to you and worship you, Heavenly Father. Now, it's been many years since I have read uh, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. It's, it's a little dated now, I think, for most of us. But if you have read it before, maybe you remember the very first sentence of his book. Right? The Purpose Driven Life, hugely influential. Right? Our church, ECCSKC, is, is kind of modeled after the, the Purpose Driven Church model. Do you know what the very first sentence of Rick Warren's book is? You remember? I, I don't know. I'm hearing maybe some of you are murmuring it. He says, It's not about you. It's not about you. Now, again, it's been many years since I've read it, but I will not forget this very first sentence. I remember it was kind of a slap in the face, right? The first time you read that book, it's kind of a slap in the face because so often we do think it is about you or it is about me. We do think it is about me. I mean, Jesus came to die for me. God loves me. He wants to bless me. How, does, how can the church serve me? How have others hurt me? Who owes me forgiveness? That's the way we functionally operate, as if it is, it is all about me. But Rick Warren's opening line, and more importantly, Jesus' opening sentence here of his prayer, does remind us, it is not about me reminds us that, that God is the main character of the Bible, of the universe, even of our lives. God is the main character. It's all about Him. I mean, we're here to play supporting roles in this drama of redemption. We are here to make the star of the story shine. And we're here to, to support the, the director's vision, not, not to steal the show. We dare not steal the show. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God's glory. It must always come first. God's glory comes first. Not our happiness, not our blessing, not our forgiveness, even. God's glory is first. And Jesus understood that. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Jesus himself doesn't even want the credit and the glory. He wants to give that glory to his Father. 
Apostle Paul teaches us, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, whatever you do, we can do it to the glory of God. And guess what? Apostle Paul didn't come up with this. Apostle Paul didn't make this up. He's simply teaching us what he was taught by Jesus himself. That it's all about God's glory. And so, we see in the, the opening line of his high priestly prayer, here in John chapter 17, Jesus asks that the Father glorify the Son only in so far that it would, as, that it would glorify the Father. All right, let's, let's dig into what it means that God glorified the Son. Verse 2 and 3. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, if you just take a look at verse 2, it's kind of confusing. It, it, it was even confusing for me what's going on. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of giving going on, right? Father give the Son, and the Son give the Father. It's confusing. I, I understand. I admit it. But if we break it down, I think we'll see three major uh, transactions. Okay. Now, the first one. Jesus is given authority over all flesh, all peoples, okay? all of humanity. Jesus has this authority. Okay. Where do we see that? You, the Father, have given him, the Son, authority over all flesh. Okay? So that's the first transaction, the first giving, the first gift, really. Now the second one. The Father gives the Son a chosen few, some people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given Him. You have given Him. So the Father has given the Son some people, okay? A chosen few. You might hear the terms those who have been predestined, or the elect, or, or whatever. But, but there's a subset of all flesh that the Father has given the Son. Okay. And the third transaction, to this smaller subset of people, these chosen few, Christ gives these people eternal life. And so we've broken down verse 2. There's three major transactions going on here. Christ gives, whom the Father has given Christ, eternal life. Okay? Now, hold on a second. What does it mean that God gave us to Jesus? That's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? God gave us to Jesus. Number one, it, it just sounds weird. It's like, wait, isn't Jesus God? And now, what? He gave us to him? What? Now, here's the way that I picture it. This is how I imagine what it means that the Father gives the Son a chosen few. I imagine it kind of like a father who has to give away his daughter at a wedding to a groom. A future son-in-law. Okay, you, you've probably gone to a wedding before. Now, this is going to happen for me in probably 50 years. <laughs> but at a wedding, a minister asks, who gives this woman to this man? Right? And then the father of the bride will say, I do. And the father of the bride is really saying, you know, this daughter of mine, she's my flesh. 
but I now give her to you, son. And I'll give you my precious daughter to have and to hold, to protect, to care for, to provide for, for the rest of your lives together. Son, I'm giving you my daughter to take care of, to be your wife. Right? And now again, it's just an analogy, it's just a metaphor, it's not perfect, but I, I suspect that's, that's kind of the idea what it means when Jesus tells us that the, the Father has given him some, a chosen few. His disciples, who Jesus is specifically praying for, and us included, those of us who have put our faith and trust in him, we are given to him into this, this new covenant relationship with the groom, the bridegroom, right? Now, what do, we what do we receive by being in this new relationship? Well, Jesus says it's nothing less than eternal life. This is eternal life, to give eternal life, and this is eternal life that they know you. So, we are given the true knowledge of God mediated by Christ. So eternal life is not just a get out of hell free card that's gonna kick in the moment we die. Eternal life is not just some disembodied future of, of floating on the clouds somewhere. Jesus tells us that eternal life can begin right now. It is knowing who God is, truly, deeply, knowing intimately, eternally, who God is. That's eternal life. It's not something that you possess. It's something that you in this relationship with an experience. We often misunderstand or misrepresent who God truly is. Jesus tells us, I want, to, I want to teach you, I want to show you who God really is. Because we get it wrong so often, so much. We often think of him as this angry father figure. And so we cower, right? We think of that as this, this wrathful judge. And so we grovel and we beg him. Or we might view him as this distant creator. So we live our lives as if he doesn't really matter, he doesn't really intervene, he doesn't really care. These are all misunderstandings, wrong knowledge of God. But Jesus seeks to correct our wrong thinking of his heavenly Father. In his ministry, he taught us about God, that, that God is our heavenly Father, who delights in his children, who we can pray to directly. God is merciful and he's patient toward those who wander, the prodigals among us. Jesus even teaches us that God is intimately connected and concerned with creation, right? Even the sparrows of the field and even the hairs on our head, God is intimately concerned with creation, his creation. And so Jesus, his whole life, his own mission has been about revealing God for who he truly is, his true character, his nature, so that we can know him rightly, truly, and then be in relationship with him. So, there's this big difference between uh, knowing of someone, knowing about someone, and knowing someone, right? So, a lot of you guys, most of you guys, I think, 
probably have Facebook, and you know this, social media of any type. Because guess what? Every single person on Facebook can know about me. They know about me, something about me. I mean, if they go to my profile page, they will know that I have a wife and three kids, that there are certain hobbies that I enjoy, like cycling and cinema. They know that my job is to pastor an evangelical church. Everybody in the world can know that about me. Everybody in the world knows about me to some degree, that Jin Liang exists, right? But you, brothers and sisters, as I see you, your faces, you know me, you know me in a different way, don't you? Because we've spent time together. We've, we've had conversations together. We've served together. You know me because you have a relationship with me. And the more you know me, the better you know me, the more you, time you've spent with me. You've gotten to know my character, my, maybe my thought processes, as scary as that may be, but you probably have come to, to understand the way that I think, the way I approach situations, when problems come up, how I deal with those problems. You know me because we have a relationship, right? You don't just know about me, you know me. And so Jesus is saying, I have come that they may know you, Father. Jesus has come to bring us into a relationship with the Heavenly Father so that we might know Him, that they may know you, right? That is that should be blowing your mind right now, that we can know God, not just know about Him. Yeah, you can read your Bible and learn about a lot of stuff about Him. That's all great, that's cool, that's fine. But we can know God, His heart, His motivations, His, even His, His, His patterns and thought processes. That's incredible, okay? We can know God. Verse four and five. We're going to finish this out here. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Okay, again, we have to kind of remember the context of when and why Jesus is praying this prayer. He's about to head to the cross. He knows that his hour has come. That his earthly ministry is nearing its end, its climax. And so he says this, I've accomplished the work that you gave me to do. I, I'm, I'm done. Mission accomplished. I, I have called your people, God's people, to repentance and faith. Read the rest of the book of John. That's what he does. I have shown you, your people, God's people, who you truly are. Again, read the rest of the book of John. That's what Jesus has done. And so, I have finished what I've been put here on earth to do. I'm ready to give my life for your glory, God, to make you known to your chosen ones. And now, I'm done. Job, job finished. I'm ready to return to you. To be one with you again. I'm ready to go. That's essentially what Jesus is saying in these two verses. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Now, I have to ask you, brothers and sisters, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? Is your mission accomplished? When you are lying on your deathbed, will you be able to lift your eyes up to heaven and say to God with a clear conscience, God, everything you have given me to do, 
I've done. God, everyone that you have given me to love, I have loved. Heavenly Father, I have lived a life of meaning and purpose, not just squandering my time and wasting it. Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to go home? Because Jesus sure is. He's ready. He's done. That's a tough question, really, to ask yourself. Are you ready to go home? And Jesus really gives us the answer. How to live a life of meaning and purpose. He says, live to know God and to make Him known. Right? Live to seek His glory and not our own. It's not about me. I don't care how many people will see or hear this message, right, that, that my name is attached to it, that I get famous or make a lot of money, which will never happen, but I don't care. I want God to be worshipped, God to be glorified. I don't even want this church to get famous or to grow and get huge. That's, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that God be glorified. Sure, church growth is, is one, uh, one way to measure that, but God should be glorified. Again, brothers and sisters, in the immortal words of Rick Warren, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about this church. It's about God and His glory. Okay, I understand it's getting kind of late. But today we get the privilege of celebrating the Lord's Supper together, um, the Holy Communion. For the first time in over a year, we get to do this together. Again, this is not something that Apostle Paul made up or created. This is something that Jesus himself instituted. We will read from 1 Corinthians 11, the institution of the Lord's table. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and, um, and, and lead us in, in contemplation and reflection. When you feel ready, please come forward and receive the elements. They are individually packaged little things like this. The top has the wafer, and then underneath is the, the juice. Please uh, come forward and receive this, and wait. Let us take this together. Okay, so when you return to your seat, uh, please reflect and pray and meditate, and, um, and we'll take this together at the, at the right time. All right.
Let us receive the Lord's body and blood with a clear conscience, with joy, with gratitude. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, you have shown us what it means to live with purpose, to live on a mission, to live for the Father's glory. Lord, I pray that we would search our hearts find ways in which maybe we have stolen the spotlight, ways in which we have stolen your glory, what you have been owed, ways in which we have not given you the glory, the fame, the worship that you so deserve. Lord Jesus, this was your dying wish as you went to the cross. And we now get to enjoy the benefits of knowing God, knowing you. Lord Jesus, we can never repay. We can never atone. We are thankful that you have done it all for us. Heavenly Father, let us live lives that reflect this truth of your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace. Lord, we so desperately want to live with meaning, with purpose, with love, to make you known because we know how good you are. So Heavenly Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here that we got to enjoy the Lord's table together after we're over a year apart. We thank you for your sustaining grace. Thank you for your spirit that has kept us connected. Thank you, Lord, for all you have given us. Most importantly, your Son, Jesus Christ. Now may the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. And all of God's people said,